Today, uh, we're starting this sort of new unit uh, for the class. So the first main unit, we had a, we had a, a, a kind of warm up unit of a kind of 19th century legacy, as you probably remember. And then we spent a, a good chunk of time right up until the previous class session on looking at physics really during the first 20 or 30 years or so of, of the 20th century. The real focus on what were um, some of the kind of approaches conceptually and uh, intellectually that uh, physicists in many parts of the world were using to try to make sense of, of nature. Uh, and that got <clears throat> kind of bound up with what we now call the, the sort of origins of modern physics, relativity and quantum theory in particular. We were also looking at the, the kinds of institutions, what kinds of settings were, were many of those investigations uh, taking place in. Uh, and so, for, so with today's class and for the next several to come, we're now looking in, at the next main unit, which is when uh, physics and physicists start, start interacting much more directly with statecraft, with, with formal overt politics, with, with governments, uh, nation state governments, and even international relations. And that, as we'll see, <clears throat> brings up a new host of questions, intellectual challenges, institutional relationships, and all that for physicists uh, throughout what we'll mostly focus on throughout uh, various parts of Europe and then the United States. Although there's lots to be said about other parts of the world too. And, and I'd be glad to talk about that if you have questions. So today we're launching this sort of next main unit of physics, physicists and the state, meaning through governments. And we're gonna start by looking actually at developments in Germany where so much of that work on what we now call modern physics had unfolded. So that's our, that's our job for today. We have as usual, three main parts for the class. We're gonna kind of re recap or revisit uh, some material that we actually looked rather briefly at a few sessions ago when, when we were talking about Einstein and the general theory of relativity. And this movement that was called Deutsche Physik, uh, which is usually translated into English as Aryan physics, a literal translation would be German, but it really meant this kind of race or racially based um, notion of what a proper approach to physics would be. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about Deutsche Physik. Then we'll pivot and talk for quite for a good chunk of today about some developments in, in nuclear physics, which was quite, quite new in this period. And in, in particular, the ideas about nuclear fission. And as you see there, uh, again, optional lecture notes on the course Canvas site to dig into some of that a bit more. I'll go through quickly some things, but there's some more details in the optional notes. And the last part for today is uh, really looking at, at sort of the collision or, or the union of, of these first two topics. And we'll look at uh, how did Werner Heisenberg himself and many of his immediate colleagues who stayed within Germany uh, after the rise of Hitler, what, was, what did nuclear physics mean for them and what did they think they were doing uh, as they worked very, very hard during um, the war years on topics related to nuclear physics and nuclear fission. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. And then on Wednesday, we'll turn and look at some uh, developments from uh, in, in Britain and, and then especially in the United States around similar time scales. Okay, so this is just a, a reminder, something we talked a little bit about when we, when we talked about general relativity. As early as the spring of 1920, I believe the very first rally was April or so of 1920, several political opportunists within Germany took advantage of the fact that Einstein himself, as well as his general theory of relativity, had become kind of overnight sensations. Einstein was everywhere in the news after the dramatic um, eclipse expedition results. He was uh, heralded uh, around the world as this amazing genius who had toppled Isaac Newton's physics. And so some opportunists within uh, kind of war ravaged Germany took advantage of Einstein's fame to try to get their own message out. Uh, their message was not really about physics, so they used physics or, or the debates about some ideas in physics to stage what was really ultimately a kind of political, uh, political movement. So they began staging anti-relativity rallies in places like sports arenas and opera houses, music halls, and so on. And the, the kind of public face, the faces that we, that we uh, that were <clears throat> most often uh, sort of headlining these events were these two German Nobel laureates in physics, both experimental physicists, Johannes Stark and Philipp Lenard. Uh, and again, there's all kinds of ironies here. Stark had actually invited Einstein back in 1907 to write a review article on Einstein's own work because Stark thought it was interesting but not getting sufficient attention. Philipp Lenard uh, won his own Nobel Prize in 1905 for Lenard's experiments on the photoelectric effect. 
which of course triggered Einstein's imagination directly. The, these folks had all kinds of kind of physics interests in common in the early years of the 20th century, but by the 1920s, they had really come quite far apart. So the rhetoric of what became known as the Deutsche Physik or Aryan physics movement was that of the Tatmensch, that is the man of action in their, in their terms. That Newton and Galileo and Michael Faraday, according to people like Philip Lennard, had all been Aryan. They'd all been of this, what, what Lennard and Stark considered the kind of uh, purest uh, kind of racial stock that they were uh, just like the, the, the kinds of people the Nazis wanted to further elevate, according to Lennard, uh, even though those Newton and Galileo and Faraday themselves would certainly not have recognized that as such. And he argued, Lennard argued that these people, unlike people like Einstein, these older heroes of physics uh, had partaken in the same kind of uh, active man of action kind of spirit as, as uh, Adolf Hitler himself. Really quite striking to go back and, and read some of this material. And as I mentioned in the previous time, in one of Lennard's books from the uh, 1940s, he would include these portraits of people like Isaac Newton shown here to try to make the, the point that these people did not have so-called Jewish features, that the, even literally the shape of their face, their nose and these things uh, proved according to, to Lennard, that they were of sort of appropriate pure racial stock, unlike uh, the people that Lennard now was denigrating so, so vehemently. So the group began on the fringes. This was really a fringe effort starting in 1920, but uh, just a little over a decade later, they had moved squarely into the center within Germany, especially after the Nazis achieved power in January of 1933. Again, as you may know, Adolf Hitler was elected chancellor of Germany uh, in late January of 33, and the entire Nazi party then began to kind of take over or, or, or you know, be put in charge of a series of, of, uh, of German government uh, ministries. Uh, and so in particular, uh, they took over things like the education ministry, as you may remember from early in class, in Germany in particular, especially after there was a single unified Germany, there was one sort of federal level, government level um, ministry that would place professors in basically every open slot within this kind of uh, state run university system. So, so the ad adherents of Deutsche Physik who had begun as early as 1920 were suddenly basically in charge of things like every single professorial appointment in all the universities in Germany, of course, much beyond that as well. So Hitler's elected in, 1930, in January of 1933. By April of that year, very quickly, the Nazis had begun to implement so-called civil service laws. These were basically race-based uh, requirements for people to hold government positions. And this included things like university faculties. There were state-run universities. So the so-called civil service laws, which forbid people of non-Aryan descent, like Jews and others, from holding government jobs, this, trigger, this starts to trigger a, a very, very uh, rapid exodus of scholars out of Germany. Either they were fired or they uh, were not personally fired, but, but were, were concerned about uh, the direction things were heading. They're left in kind of protest over the way their colleagues and students were treated. Uh, and so this triggers about 100 physicists and mathematicians who leave Germany pretty quickly uh, in starting in around 1933 and many of them head toward both Britain and the United States. They move, some of them move permanently, some of them move for the duration of the war and then, and then relocate back to Germany. But many of them never went back. So most famously, Einstein himself left Germany, renounced his um, position with, with the Prussian Academy of Sciences, and he moved to um, the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, New Jersey. In fact, he was the first faculty member hired there. The Institute itself was, was brand new. So Einstein moves to the United States, Erwin Schrodinger, who is not Jewish, uh, but nonetheless uh, was, was very concerned very quickly at the direction of these so-called civil service laws. He resigned his position in Berlin. He moved to Oxford and then settled in, in Dublin for the duration of the war. Emmy Noether, who was an immensely influential mathematical physicist from Göttingen, she left Germany uh, and she was hired at Bryn Mawr, a women's college in Pennsylvania. Max Born also left Göttingen. He went first to Cambridge, then uh, in to Edinburgh for the duration of the war. Uh, younger scholars like Hans Bethe left uh, positions in Germany and he moved to Cornell and was had a, a very, very long, long, long career at Cornell. Uh, he, he arrived at Cornell around 1935 and he um, 
stayed there. He was a professor there for maybe 60 or, or even more than 60 years. He had an enormously long career. James Franck uh, moved to the University of Chicago. Felix walked to Stanford. Vicky Weisskopf eventually makes his way to MIT, first by way of Rochester, and so on. It's literally a hundred of these cases that have been uh, well documented. And what's really important to keep in mind is that these were by no means easy transitions. For some, they were pretty easy. Einstein was welcomed immediately at the Institute for Advanced Study. It was a great boon for that new young institute. But many of these other folks who were neither so famous as Einstein nor entering such brand new institutions, for many of these other folks, it was actually not an easy, an easy move. The United States itself, like many parts of the world, not just in Europe or North America, was deep into a Great Depression. Uh, this was already several years in. So there were many US-based scholars in this case looking for university positions as well as all kinds of jobs. Unemployment was, was rampant throughout the United States. But even beyond that, there was an entrenched, and by, again, by now well-documented anti-Semitism throughout many, many US universities, including um, sometimes most rapidly among the most elite universities, the Ivy League and, and others um, like that. So that sometimes it was actually hard to place these people uh, who were extremely eminent and, and, uh, and already decorated in their fields, uh, but many US universities uh, balked or, or dragged their feet. An example of that involves Robert Oppenheimer, someone we'll be talking quite a lot about in the coming lectures. Oppenheimer uh, was born in New York City. He wasn't someone who had to flee Germany, but he, when he was hired at Berkeley in 1929, before the, the, the rise of the Nazis, uh, the department had had to work extra hard to get him hired in a department that already had something like 60 faculty, a huge department, because the department already had one other person of Jewish background in the department. And so the department chair had to fight against the notion of having, quote unquote, too many Jews in a huge department by hiring this second one in. And that was even before you have this uh, kind of exodus uh, with the rise of the Nazis. Likewise, at Dartmouth College, my alma, alma mater, so I'm not picking on uh, a stranger here. Again, in, in once these uh, sort of outflow began in the early 30s, correspondence has turned up that they were perfectly happy to bring in a refugee faculty candidate, as long as the candidate, quote, shouldn't seem too Jewish. So uh, there was a kind of entrenched anti-Semitism among even very, very elite, or especially very elite US universities, and that compounded the difficulties of placing some of these people who many of whom had to flee under very dire circumstances. Okay, that's for the people who, who, uh, who did leave uh, after the rise of the Nazis. What about some who stayed behind? So within Germany, especially once you know, the Nazis had taken over, Nazi officials, which included the German education ministry and beyond, began criticizing physicists who were not themselves of Jewish background, but who seemed to demonstrate what at least the Nazi officials considered insufficient loyalty to the regime. And one way that these folks supposedly demonstrated insufficient loyalty was that they continued to teach what was by that time branded so-called Jewish physics, which meant physics either by people who were of Jewish background like relativity or physics that struck some of these Deutsche Physik uh, acolytes like Stark or Lenard as being somehow too mathematical, too abstract, too removed from kind of proper forms of reasoning. Often it was actually just more crude. Was that, was that work done by someone who was Jewish? Then it's Jewish physics. Often it was just a, a simple conflation. This uh, reached its real apogee. The real highlight uh, or the highest point of this kind of um, uh, attack occurred in 1937, so several years uh, into the regime when in fact the, the sort of acolytes of Deutsche Physik, who now were, uh, had the ear of the German education ministry, they managed to block the appointment of Werner Heisenberg, who everyone within Germany and beyond Germany had just simply assumed would be appointed, would get a big promotion when his own main mentor retired. So as you may remember from some lectures on uh, so-called old quantum theory a few sessions ago, Arnold Sommerfeld, was the kind of head professor, the ordinarius professor in Munich for theoretical physics. He trained an enormous number of gifted disciples, including Heisenberg, Wolfgang Pauli, Hans Bethe, just a huge list. And by this point, Heisenberg was clearly Sommerfeld's most famous, most accomplished student. Heisenberg had already received the Nobel Prize by this point for his work on quantum theory. Sommerfeld retired after a long career and everyone just assumed, including Heisenberg himself, that the central ministry would simply appoint Heisenberg as the successor. Uh, 
Instead, the, the, the Deutsche Physik kind of um, ideologues organized a press campaign against Heisenberg, labeling him what was called a white Jew. And again, that was their term. We said that we know he's not personally of Jewish background, but he behaves in too friendly a manner in, in their reckoning. He was too supportive of things like Jewish physics because he kept teaching relativity, for example, in his classes. So they labeled him a white Jew and began a real kind of a press a smear campaign in, in the Gestapo controlled press. Things could really have gotten worse. In fact, there was a real concern that Heisenberg himself might have been sent off to a concentration camp or, or, or certainly could have, had, could have faced much worse treatment than only being denied a promotion. And what finally uh, stopped the attack was that Heisenberg's mother interceded directly with a close family friend who happened to be the mother of Heinrich Himmler. Himmler shown here in the circle. Himmler by that point was the chief of the SS, one of these param paramilitary Nazi forces. Here's Himmler with, with Hitler and, and uh, other Nazi officials just a few years before they kind of took over. So it was really kind of an accident of who knows who, Heisenberg's mother calling up the mother of Himmler because they, they had known each other when they were each younger and basically said, can our boys get along? It was quite extraordinary. It, it took that level of kind of back, back room negotiations uh, to make sure that not worse happened to Heisenberg than only getting uh, passed over for a fancy promotion. Okay. So that's usually seen as the kind of apogee of the power of this Deutsche Physik movement within Germany. Obviously, the Nazis weren't done in 1937, as I'm sure you know, the war dragged on uh, until uh, 1945. Um, but this was really the high point of this kind of power of Deutsche Physik. Um, so not that the Nazis went away, but this notion of having a kind of racially pure or kind of ideological tests for physics, that begins to wane uh, very soon after this very dramatic showdown over Heisenberg's promotion. And in fact, what many historians have come to conclude is that the regime, the Nazis in power said, we actually could have real uses for all these physicists, uh, at least the ones who weren't of Jewish background. That physics might not be only associated with kind of philosophy or ideology or kind of political talking points, but there was something stirring which got even to the highest levels of the Nazi party by the late 1930s that maybe physics and physicists could be useful, could be manifestly useful to Nazi aims and not merely something to be kind of policed as a kind of thought police. And what had changed really was summed up in two words, nuclear physics. So let me pause there. We're gonna have some questions and discussion and then we'll look at some of the work in nuclear physics they were, that they were talking about. Any questions about that? Had anyone heard that story before about Heisenberg and his mother and Himmler's mother? I just find that astonishing. Talk about small world networks. <clears throat> nope. Okay. I'm happy to, to press on. We got a lot of, of uh, juicy stuff we can talk about uh, for, for nuclear physics, but if any questions come up about Deutsche Physik, of course, um, chime in. But if, if not, I think I'll, I'll press on. Okay. Obi, did you have a question? Was it? Oh, okay, okay. Uh, yeah, if only somebody called Hitler's money, exactly. <clears throat> Can you imagine? Gary says, if all these remarkable physicists stayed in Germany, what would have been the results of war? Yeah, <laughs> it's, Gary, thank you. In fact, we'll be coming to that. That sort of a, it sets up much of the rest of today's class. Uh, yeah, so you lose as if only been accepted at art school, meaning Hitler, not Heisenberg. So some of you may know Hitler was himself a kind of, um, aspiring painter as a young person. Uh, and he felt slights at every turn, including that he was never admitted to the to his sort of hope for art school. Every, the world was out to get him as far as he was concerned. Um, Alex asked a very interesting question. Why did Heisenberg stay behind? Very good. And again, we'll, we'll, we'll talk a bit about that or that will come up in some of the themes in the next part. But as a preview, it's important to, to clarify. Heisenberg never ever joined the Nazi party. He never expressed anything like a clear sympathy with the most kind of vile um, parts of the Nazi worldview. So I want to be very clear. On the other hand, he would, Heisenberg was very, very patriotic. He was someone who, who had a deep, deep pride in a kind of longer view of German learning and German culture. And again, we'll come to that actually pretty soon. So he was a patriotic German and not a Nazi. And he believed as many of his colleagues did, many, many German scientists stayed behind. 
He believed that the Nazis, he hoped in the early years, he believed that this would be a temporary aberration, that the Nazis were so counter to what, what Heisenberg himself considered the kind of highest points of German learning and German philosophy and German culture, that this would be a temporary kind of fever. The fever would break, the, the Nazis would, would, be, would be run out of town soon, he hoped or believed, and therefore there should be some kind of intellectual leaders who stayed behind to rebuild. So he thought there'd be a need uh, for many, many smart, devoted Germans who weren't Nazis, but who were proud of the kind of longer heritage of German learning and culture. Think about all the composers and the poets, and they had this long list of which they were, you know, very, very proud. So they thought they thought they'd, they'd have to stick around because this Nazi thing was going to go away soon. They hoped, and then Germany would have to rebuild, uh, and that was and so it was a kind of patriotism rather than than Nazism, per se. But that became, you know, for many other people who had, who did leave Germany, either because they felt they really had to for personal safety, or people like Schrodinger who were, who were critics of the regime but were not in the same kind of personal danger. That kind of argument didn't, you know, didn't convince everyone. Obviously, not everyone thought um, this. Thought that Heisenberg, some people thought Heisenberg was kind of fooling himself, or, or the people like Heisenberg who, who chose to stay. So it was not at all obvious that this was, you know, even at the time, this was the. Um, the, the best course of action or, or, the, or the morally uh, appropriate one. But it was tricky. And so the, short, the shorter version is Heisenberg was deeply patriotic uh, and, and not a Nazi. And he, he hoped he could help kind of rebuild the, the country he loved so much. And he hoped it would come soon. That's a good question. Any other questions on that? It's actually a great segue to the next part. Okay, let's, let's press on. Let's <clears throat> see what else, what, what might have helped convince um, even the ardent Nazis, that there were other reasons to, to think about physics in new ways. So we're gonna step back a little bit and uh, look at some of the kind of conceptual developments and experimental developments that have been going on uh, really just in remarkable synchrony with, with uh, the Deutsche Physik movement and the rise of the Nazis. So throughout the late 20s and into the early 30s, several research groups really throughout, certainly throughout Europe and, and, and beyond, were working on um, they were working on radioactivity that dated back to the uh, 1890s. But, the, but this group by this point, about 20 or almost, almost 30 years in, began to suspect that there was more going on within atomic nuclei than only protons. That there might be a, actually a whole second kind of particle within these nuclei. And again, to us, this sounds like no duh, how do they know that? We know that because they worked so hard to figure this out. They thought there could be an electrically neutral particle whose mass was at least pretty close to that of the proton, but would not respond to the electromagnetic, um, would not respond to, to electric attractions or repulsions the way a proton does. Uh, and they had all kinds of reasons for, for thinking along these lines. Among the real kind of world leaders on that topic was a, a husband and wife team or a wife and husband team, Eren and Frédéric Joliot Curie. Eren uh, Curie was one of the daughters of Marie and Pierre Curie. So she entered the family business uh, she married uh, Frederick, who was also a nuclear scientist, and they uh, also uh, set up a you know, world-class laboratory in Paris, really kind of taking the mantle from, from Marie and Pierre. Uh, and one of the things that they were especially adept at studying was something called um, in, uh, artificial radioactivity. It really meant induced radioactivity. So uh, Marie Curie and Pierre and members of their generation, uh, even younger folks like Rutherford, They'd been excited about uh, natural emitters, substances that were art that were radioactive without you having to do anything to them. They would emit these radiations, alpha particles, beta particles, gamma rays, uh, sort of on their own because of some kind of natural radioactive properties. By this next generation, literally next generation, meaning the daughter, Irene, uh, and, and Frederic, they were wondering, could they actually create radioactivity or induce it by taking materials that were not on their own radioactive, irradiating them, having a radioactive source bombard them with radiations, alpha particles, beta particles, or whatever, and have that new target that they had shown this stuff onto, could that then become radioactive as well? That became known as artificial. It really means induced radioactivity. Uh, and, that, and this became sort of the next big frontier for trying to understand radioactivity in general, and, and by means of that, trying to get more clarity on the structure of atoms and nuclei. <clears throat> Uh, and so, and as you see, uh, uh, Iran and Frederick shared the, the 1935 Nobel Prize in chemistry for their work. They really had already become world leaders in that. 
right just a little bit before they, they won the prize and they're already very clearly at the kind of the top of the game in that field. One of their colleagues, James Chadwick, who was in Britain, uh, followed up on one of their suggestions. And in fact, he basically redid an experiment that, that the Joliot Curies had done almost exactly, but he, he thought they weren't quite interpreting it quite right. So he wanted to zoom in on this. So Chadwick had been a student of Ernest Rutherford's at Manchester, and by this point was himself now a more senior researcher at the Cavendish back in Cambridge. So this again really was an experimental design uh, almost entirely coming from Iran and Frédéric Joliot Curie, but Chadwick gave it a, a little tweak to try to clarify some things. The idea was to take one of these natural radioactive sources, in this case, polonium, and that's what we, what we called an alpha emitter. So all on its own, polonium will be radioactive and its form of emission uh, is alpha particles. So then they would shine the alpha particles onto a, a, a target, a block of beryllium, and then some different kind of radiation would come out. They had now induced radioactivity. Beryllium on its own was not radioactive. They could induce a radioactive kind of uh, response by irradiating it with alpha particles. Some as yet unknown stuff came out. They could then, uh, Chadwick's idea was to shine that onto uh, paraffin wax, a very hydrogen rich uh, substance, very, uh, each, each atom of which is very, very lightweight. And then protons came out and then it could measure basically the kind of stopping power of those protons. So what, what Chadwick clarified, which uh, the one of the few times that Iran and Frederick Joliot Curie had not kind of just nailed it the first time. So Chadwick came in and clarified was that this unknown radiation, the, the stuff that came flying out upon irradiating beryllium with alpha particles was this long suspected neutral particle, electrically neutral with a mass pretty close to that of protons. So the way that Chadwick makes, made sense of this reaction was that there were alpha particles coming out from the polonium encountering the beryllium that would convert into a, a, a stable carbon atom and have this unknown radiation be the neutron. And again, this is probably familiar notation for you. The lower, no, the subscript number here is what's called the atomic number. That just counts the number of protons. The placement of any of these items on the periodic table is determined by the number of protons in the nucleus. And the superscript, the, the raised number, is the atomic mass. So how many basically proton masses worth did that item weigh? So an alpha particle is, has two units of electric charge, uh, twice the charge of the proton, but is four times as heavy as a proton, beryllium carbon. So, so the, uh, the neutron would have had no electric charge. It had zero times the charge of a proton, but had about the same mass as a proton. And that's what Chadwick finally clarified, in part because of the paraffin here. He was able to not the, the, to have the, the, this, the particles of this unknown radiation collide, basically have two body collisions with the very proton rich targets in the paraffin. And then he could measure the energy with which the protons came out with a kind of stopping power, uh, much like we saw say Lennard do for, for the photoelectric effect. So with that, he could infer that each individual particle coming out here had a mass pretty similar to that of the protons because of the recoil pattern. Uh, and that's when the first kind of really compelling empirical evidence for this new thing in the nucleus called the neutron that really um, uh, was, was introduced. And so Chadwick's work was also recognized very, very quickly. So in the year that the Joliot Curies shared the Nobel Prize in Chemistry, Chadwick won that same year the Nobel Prize in Physics. This was, this was capturing people's attention right away. Among those people whose attention it captured right away was Enrico Fermi, another at this point still pretty young full professor in Rome. Fermi was, was very eager to get the Rome group kind of on the map. Everyone was, was kind of jealous of, of Paris and the Cavendish and some of these other centers of research. And Fermi thought it was time to get his group really up to the same kind of quality. So Fermi had just only recently uh, been made a full professor and given a kind of uh, research lab, well-funded group in, in Rome. And he realized that neutrons, unlike alpha particles, because the neutrons are electrically neutral, they might be able to do even more effective induced radioactive reactions because you're not gonna have a kind of electrostatic repulsion of the alpha particle with its positive charge, some rep getting repelled by the target it's trying to, to strike like the positive charged nucleus of a target substance. So the neutron, since it had no electric charge, Fermi realized could maybe be an even better inducer of these nuclear reactions because it can somehow get perhaps even closer into the action, so to speak, without suffering that Coulomb repulsion. 
So he and his group were very, very methodical, and they basically tried to get purified elemental sources of almost every single element on the periodic table, starting practically with hydrogen and helium, starting very, very early on, certainly beryllium, and marching just one by one up all every single known chemical element, or as many of them as they could. They got to the very end of the known chart. They got up to uranium, which was at the time the heaviest known, most massive element on the periodic table, the one with the largest number of protons in its nucleus, uh, atomic number 92. And they would do the same trick. They would irradiate purified samples of each of these elements, including uranium, with a source of neutrons. Uh, and they would and they would often, not every, every time, but often they would be able to induce uh, radioactivity, much as the joliot curies had been doing, and they could measure the response with Geiger counters and all the rest. What Fermi found was they got especially strong reaction rates. They would really get this uranium to start acting like a radioactive material when Fermi placed a block of paraffin, this, this lightweight wax, between the neutron and the uranium target. So now with Chadwick, the paraffin was to kind of uh, to interact with the, uh, the neutrons that came flying out uh, after the neutrons had already uh, come from a target. Now Fermi places the, the paraffin wax between the source of neutrons and in this case, say the uranium target. So what the Rome group assumed they were measuring, and you can see this in this very, one of the uh, whole series of papers that they published, this one by Fermi himself, others had, had about five or six uh, co-authors. They thought they actually had made new elements. They thought they had gone beyond the then highest known atomic number. As you see that here, his paper in Nature was the possible production of elements of atomic number higher than 92, meaning uh, atomic number beyond uranium. So they thought what they were doing was, it was taking a uranium uh, target, so each atom which had 92 protons, a total mass of 238. They would uh, irradiate it with neutrons and they, the, the uranium target would, would do what was what would soon be called neutron capture. So it would absorb that incoming neutron. So what happens then? The atomic number has not changed, right? This has zero proton units. So the 92 plus zero remains 92. You still have uranium but the actual mass has increased by one unit. So neutron capture does not change the chemical identity of the target. It's still uranium, it still has only 92 protons in the nucleus, but you change it to a different isotope, same number of protons, different total uh, atomic mass, in this case, one more neutron. And then after some time, the neutron that had been absorbed would itself undergo a radioactive decay, a so-called beta decay, where the neutron would transform into a proton sorry, transform into a proton, and then a beta ray, an electron would come flying out. It was actually Fermi uh, who, who built upon suggestions by people like Wolfgang Pauli, saying that actually it has to be more than just a beta decay to get the sort of energy momentum to balance, to work out. So uh, an electron and some as yet unseen extra particle that they eventually called the neutrino, now we call it an antineutrino. Stuff comes flying out. The, the, the main thing is that the neutron transformed into a proton, so now inside that nucleus, you have 92 plus one protons. You've actually perhaps, possibly, made an element that's chemically distinct from uranium. You've actually pushed it up one place on the periodic table because now it seems to have a total of 93 protons. And yet since the proton and neutron have basically the same mass, the atomic mass stays the same. So the idea was Fermi and his group were convinced they had conducted neutron capture followed by beta decay. They thought they had produced the first transuranic element. This would eventually be called Neptunium. Just like in the solar system, the planet Neptune is the first planet beyond Uranus. This would be the first uh, element beyond Uranium. <clears throat> I actually got to see these materials uh, the, the, most, the last trip I was able to make before the pandemic, although I didn't know that at the time. I actually was in Rome for a few days glorious few days this past January, not quite a year ago. And I got to see in this brand new Fermi Museum on the very site of his laboratory, there's now a museum that uh, in principle is open to the public though, it's sealed up now I'm sure. And this was the actual lead lined case in which they had their radioactive sources. This is the block of paraffin that Fermi used. It's like, I couldn't believe it was right there. I've been reading about this thing since I was a kid. And here are some of the examples of these purified elements, the targets that they would irradiate with the, with the, neutron, uh, with the neutrons that had gone through the paraffin wax. Uh, and here, this is what happens if you start filming in the streets of Rome, uh, you get pulled over by the police. So it was actually there working on a documentary with Nova about Fermi and neutrons and neutrinos. 
and the police didn't realize we had all the proper paperwork. Here's uh, um, Rosemary Cafferty, the production assistant, saying, no, no, nice police officers. We do have the permits. Anyway, so I got to see lots of things in Rome, including Fermi's actual experiments. That was pretty awesome. OK, so Fermi's work actually triggered a lot of reactions in the human realm and not only in the nuclear realm. So this work was, again, seen as just unbelievably interesting and important. He starts publishing this in 1934. The main body of work comes out throughout 1935. By 1938, he again, had, this work had been recognized as worthy of the Nobel Prize. Here's Fermi getting permission, excuse me, winning, winning the Nobel Prize, receiving it from the King of Sweden, December of 1938, just three or four years after starting that whole series of investigations. Now that timing's pretty remarkable. As again, many of you probably know, Italy by this point, since the 20s, have been ruled by a fascist dictator, a self-pronounced fascist dictator, Benito Mussolini. Mussolini was not in the earliest days as rapidly anti-Semitic as he would become, but after Hitler uh, 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 attained power in Germany, uh, Hitler and Mussolini made a series of kind of pacts and Mussolini's policies began mirroring or getting much closer to those of the overt anti-Semitism and, and so-called racial purity of the Nazis. So by the early and mid 1930s, uh, Mussolini's regime in Italy was, was becoming as dangerous for people of Jewish background as Hitler's was in Germany. That mattered a great deal to Fermi. Fermi himself was not Jewish, but his wife, Laura, was from a Jewish family. And even though Fermi was this big fancy professor uh, getting lots and lots of, of support from the central government for his research, it was becoming more and more clear that this was, no, this was not going to remain um, a kind of easy existence for them uh, with a Jewish member of the family as Mussolini began aligning policies more and more closely with those of uh, the Nazis. So what Fermi arranged uh, upon learning that he would receive the Nobel Prize was that his entire family, his immediate family could travel with him to Stockholm to win the prize and they basically snuck out. So Mussolini couldn't help but let Fermi leave the country for Italy's grandeur. It was important to let Fermi receive the Nobel Prize and then basically behind Mussolini's back, Fermi had arranged in secret to have his immediate family skip town, to leave almost directly from Stockholm, get on a, on a, a steamboat out of, uh, I think the UK, and sail right to New York City. It's a lot like if, if you've seen the, the famous movie, um, The Sound of Music, it's, it's a lot. You know, uh, ceremony full of fanfare and, and, and just escaped. Uh, and so Fermi and his immediate family moved uh, and resettled for a time in New York City. So the, the, this is a reminder of the timing. We have this exciting new work in nuclear physics, new particles found, new, way, new kinds of nuclear transformations. The world scientists are, are getting very, very excited about this at just the moment when fascists are taking over uh, many, many parts within Europe. Now, it turns out other groups were actively working on exactly these kinds of nuclear transformations. After all, Fermi won the Nobel Prize, partly because everyone, many, many people in the field agreed this was really, really kind of hot stuff. This is important stuff. So many groups were working on either replicating Fermi's series of experiments with his neutron capture, trying to uh, uh, irradiate uh, other sources, find other isotopes, and, and possibly even new elements. And one of the most active in this group was a team based in Berlin. What's really interesting about this Berlin group is that they were explicitly multidisciplinary, even more so, certainly more so than Fermi's group, even arguably more than the Joliot Curies or similar at least to them. So the group included a, a theoretical physicist, Lisa Meitner, as well as two very accomplished nuclear chemists, Otto Hahn and Fritz Strassmann. Uh, and for today's readings, I, 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 we have a little, uh, an excerpt that's drawn from uh, this really quite amazing biography of Meitner uh, by Ruth Lewin Sy. Uh, again, for those of you who might be interested, I, I can't recommend this book highly enough. I just think this book is, is, is gripping and moving and beautifully uh, written, uh, Syme's biography of Meitner. So uh, I couldn't assign the whole book, but I do encourage you um, to read even more from, from Syme's biography uh, if, if you have the time. There's a little taste of an article that uh, Ruth wrote with some colleagues in Physics Today, and then a kind of short piece inspired by her book by uh, the very talented science writer, uh, Maria Popover. But I think there's sort of no substitute for, for this biography. Meitner, I think, is just endlessly fascinating. So what do we learn from, from uh, Syme's biography? Meitner, uh, Lisa Meitner, grew up in a Jewish family in Austria. 
uh, and she was uh, therefore only allowed to attend formal school until age 14. At that point, the rules in the late years of the Habsburg Empire, girls couldn't even finish high school. They weren't allowed to finish high school. They could go to school through age 14. Uh, and during uh, Meitner's kind of later teenage years, there was a, a series of reforms, state, you know, uh, nationwide reforms in Austria that actually relaxed those rules. So then Meitner rushed through all the years she'd missed of the remaining years of, of what would have been a standard high school curriculum, mostly through self-study. She finished high school effectively in a few months and then even more astonishing, passed the entrance exam to study physics at the, at the very elite uh, University of Vienna which otherwise would never have been allowed to her until these reforms had come into place. So uh, she then studied very hard uh, and she was among the first women anywhere to earn not just an undergraduate degree, but actually a full PhD in physics. Uh, she earned her, her PhD in 1905 and then she very quickly began to collaborate with Otto Hahn in Berlin. She had a few short-term uh, kind of fellowships and then uh, eventually was hired, sort of hired uh, in Berlin. Uh, she was allowed to work with him. Han was glad to work with her, but she was only allowed to go into the basement of this institute in Berlin because women were literally not allowed into the main institute. Not just that there weren't like women's restrooms. They weren't allowed on the first, second, third floor. So Han, to accommodate this very, very brilliant co uh, you know, co collaborator, colleague, agreed to work in what was essentially a kind of shop, a kind of woodworking shop in the basement of the otherwise very fancy institute in Berlin. And that's how the collaboration started. Meitner as a young and upcoming uh, theoretical physicist uh, and Hahn as an accomplished chemist. And here they are many years later working uh, in, in their um, lab together uh, in the later thirties. So what happens is in 1933, when Hitler uh, is elected and the so-called civil service laws go into effect by that spring, people who are of Jewish background and German citizens could no longer hold university positions uh, or other government jobs. Uh, Lisa Meitner was not a German citizen. She was an Austrian. So it's quite astonishing that she was Jewish. Everyone knew she was Jewish and she was able to keep her job because according to these new laws, they didn't apply to her. They applied to German citizens of Jewish background. That changed in the spring of 1938 or beginning in the spring of 38. Uh, because again, as, as some of you may know, uh, by that point, there was what is called the Anschluss, which is when not welcomed it. But in any case, Austria became sort of absorbed within the German, the, the Nazi Reich. So now Austria and therefore Austrians were subject to the kind of German laws, including these so-called civil service laws, these anti-Jewish employment laws. So only in, in late spring, early summer 1938, rather than spring of 1933, was Meitner no longer uh, entitled, uh, according to these new laws, to keep her job. So she actually had to flee in a hurry several years after this kind of exodus had begun. <clears throat> so Meitner actually got a temporary position in Stockholm. She was able to flee to, to, uh, to Sweden. And in the meantime, Hahn and Strassmann in their Berlin laboratory continued these neutron bombardment experiments, again, doing just like what the Fermi group had, had gotten so famous for. They redid Fermi's experiments multiple times, even to the day at which Fermi was literally shaking the king's hand and receiving his Nobel Prize, right, throughout the month of December. But unlike Fermi and unlike the Nobel Committee, Hahn and Strassmann concluded that neither Fermi nor they in their own lab had actually produced these elements beyond uranium. So literally while Fermi was receiving the prize for having made transuranic elements, Hahn and Strassmann convinced themselves that no, he didn't and neither had they. So this is a, an example of a periodic table from um, uh, 1938. You can see it ends at uranium. So whereas uh, Fermi and the Nobel committee and all the experts, nearly all the experts, uh, there were a few detractors, but nearly all the experts had assumed that Fermi had nudged uh, you know, these, these nuclei up by one or maybe two places here beyond uranium, what Hahn and Strassmann kind of grudgingly conclude uh, using their chemist's knowledge, not their, not their notion as physicists, is in fact, the uranium target had been split. It hadn't been nudged to one step uh, larger, one step beyond uranium on the periodic table. It had actually broken into two much smaller pieces uh, midway down the periodic table into, for example, a barium fragment and a krypton fragment. 
where again, the, the atomic number would add up. You had 92 protons to start, you have 92 protons at the end, but not by having made one slightly larger blob of say Neptunium or some transuranic, but in fact, by splitting that initial target nucleus into two much smaller pieces. Uh, and they, and they uh, wrote this up in December. It was published in, almost immediately in uh, some Prussian Academy uh, publications in January of 1939. And they conclude this with this very famous uh, closing. They say, as chemists, we must actually say the new particles that result, the, the, the products after this reaction, behave like, uh, uh, do not behave like radium, but in fact, like barium. In other words, it looks like they really had been knocked all the way down here, not uh, in the vicinity of uranium. So as chemists, we say we found barium. As nuclear physicists, we cannot make this conclusion, which is in conflict with all experience in nuclear physics. There is no known nuclear transformation to date after 40 years of studying such things in which there have been that large a leap, either up or down the periodic table. And I talk a bit more about this uh, in, the, in the optional lecture notes. All the known transformations, alpha decay would knock you down two places, beta decay not uh, bring you up you would be moving one or two places in your immediate vicinity, not sort of halfway down the table. <clears throat> so while she was now on the run, she had just, uh, just arrived at a, a kind of temporary position in Stockholm, Meitner received an update from Otto Hahn about these latest experiments in, indicating the presence of barium, which again, to emphasize Hahn and Strassmann as chemists knew how to do proper chemical analyses to test for barium. And they, and they were more and more convinced that's what was there. So Meitner gets the update uh, from Hahn. She has a little break with her nephew, another theoretical physicist, Otto Robert Frisch. He often went just by Robert. Uh, Frisch was uh, actually at this point a postdoc in Copenhagen. So he's also in Scandinavia. He was able to come see his aunt. Uh, they had a few days together uh, in, outside of Stockholm in a little ski vacation, cross-country skiing. And it's while there that, uh, that Meitner had just received this letter from Hahn. Frisch comes and they spend the day talking about how Hahn and Strassmann's results could possibly be true. And while away from any kind of workspace, well, literally spending the day uh, out in the woods, uh, snow covered woods, they work out the first ever physical model of nuclear fission. It's quite extraordinary. And again, there's plenty more in, in the optional notes uh, to spell this out in more detail. They began to argue or to convince themselves that slow neutrons were the key that remember Fermi was finding increased reaction rates when we put that block of paraffin, that wax between the neutrons and the target uranium. And they argue that that must have been because the paraffin was slowing down the neutrons. There'd be enough scattering and recoil that the neutrons that made it through the paraffin would have lost a significant amount of energy from having scattered off an object of comparable size. And so they should be slowed down by their travel through that moderator, through that, system, through that material that would slow down their kinetic energy. And then Meitner and Frisch, unlike Fermi at first, Meitner and Frisch realized, well, if the momentum of these uh, neutrons has been reduced, then the quantum-like behavior should have been exaggerated. If you go back to the de Broglie wavelength, remember we saw this inherent waviness uh, associated uh, quantum mechanically with any solid matter. It's proportional to Planck's constant, but inversely proportional to the momentum. So if the neutrons are being slowed down through, the, say, that paraffin wax, then the velocity would be small. The waviness, the characteristic size of this quantum wave, would be enhanced. So maybe, even though this uranium nucleus is nearly 240 times bigger than uh, or more massive than the inbound neutron, if that neutron had been slowed so its quantum properties have been stretched, the quantumness, so to speak, the wavelength, might be comparable in size to this entire uranium target. Maybe you could set the entire target wobbling coherently. You could get a kind of coherent or collective response to the single bombardment by the incoming neutron. And they begin again working out this kind of picture that this neutron might be like a kind of liquid drop. That was a model that Niels Bohr himself had been working out for a while. This kind of uh, barely stable uh, equilibrium between a kind of surface tension keeping it together and a volume pressure uh, that would uh, work it, it to in, work against the surface tension. And there might be just a, ba a balancing point when you get to very large nuclei like uranium. Uh, 
So once this kind of stretched out, slowed neutron encounters the nucleus, it gets at the whole drop wobbling. And in fact, you could actually have this sort of thin neck appear. And then finally, because this is now a very uh, dense pack of positively charged protons, this is a separate densely packed uh, region of positive protons. They can now repel each other. Maybe this neck will, will rupture and you'll actually get two smaller pieces. So maybe the one large nucleus could split in two because it was hit by a slow moving neutron. They go on, again, this part is, is done in much more detail in the notes, I'll just go quickly here. Still on the ski holiday while basically on a, a bench or leaning against a tree, they try to, to wonder, would, would this work? Could they get a kind of order of magnitude estimate of this kind of um, process? And they realize that the energy scale, the rough energies involved, if this uh, splitting of a uranium nucleus were to hold, we, they could estimate by the kind of Coulomb repulsion of all the pieces, all the protons within that nucleus. They have a, a, about 100 protons, 92, so order of magnitude about 100 protons, each with unit charge. And they're packed within a very small um, uh, volume. The average nuclear radii, they knew by this point, was in the order of um, a hundredth of an angstrom. Uh, and so on the order of, oh no, excuse me, uh, 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 10,000 of an angstrom, so around 10 to the minus 12 centimeters. Meanwhile, the kind of typical energy scales for chemical reactions is where you're basically moving one or two electrons across distances of an atomic size, not a nuclear size. So if you take the ratio of the kind of typical energy scales that seem to be involved in these nuclear transformations compared to typical energy scales for chemical ones, the nuclear ones should be about 100 million times larger energies just from this kind of uh, how many uh, charges can you, are, are you moving around and what kind of volume? Very, very kind of order of magnitude rough estimate that they're doing literally on, on a bench while taking a break from skiing. Meanwhile, after splitting apart, if this really were to happen, you have two roughly equal pieces of what had once been a single uh, nucleus. Each piece will carry as they go through, and I, I replicate that uh, algebra in the, pri in, the, in the notes, each piece following splitting would carry about one third of that starting energy. So this nuclear energy of the starting uh, blob of roughly hundred charged particles, after splitting each piece would only carry about a third of that. So you have two pieces, you have one third of that kind of raw energy still to account for. And that would be this energy released every time a single large unstable nucleus undergoes this splitting. So you have one third of this enormous energy scale sort of available or released every time they estimate, every time a single nucleus is split in this, in this fashion. It turns out that estimate is consistent with people who then fill this in within a few months with a different way of estimating the energy scales, uh, not based on a kind of classical Coulomb repulsion, how many protons over here are repelling, how many protons over there, but actually based on e equals mc squared. That the total mass of the uranium nucleus before it splits is actually great, uh, is actually, sorry, less than uh, the mass of the barium and the krypton. There's a binding energy left over, negative binding energy. Uh, and that actually is what's released uh, when, when this initial thing splits. And that release times C squared gives you again, the exact same kind of estimate as you get from this classical kind of electrostatic repulsion. That was worked out in detail by Bohr himself with another colleague. So Frisch returns to Bohr's Institute in late December. He tells Bohr all about this. Bohr was very excited about nuclear physics by this point. Frisch was Bohr's postdoc. Frisch tells him all about Meitner's and Frisch's ideas that maybe this big nucleus is just barely stable and could actually be split apart into two small pieces. He asks Bohr to keep it to himself. He and Meitner were gonna keep working on it, uh, maybe even perform some laboratory tests and so on, which in fact, uh, Frisch did wind up doing. Meanwhile, Bohr was set to leave almost practically the next day, very soon afterwards, to sail uh, to the United States. He was scheduled to spend a sabbatical at Princeton, at Princeton University, right near the Institute for Advanced Study. So he does that. He sails to New York. He's actually met at the docks in New York City by Enrico Fermi, who had just fled. He had just left uh, um, by way of his Nobel Prize ceremony. Younger uh, folks like Sam Gauchmitt, whom we heard about before, we'll hear more about soon. Gauchmitt had also fled uh, the Netherlands and had moved to the United States some years before. Bohr basically gets off the boat and tells him, you won't believe what I've just learned, nuclear fission is possible. So even though Frisch had asked him to keep it quiet, Bohr basically can't help himself. He's spilling the beans to his physics colleagues practically on the docks as soon as he arrives in New York City. 
Then he gets to Princeton, he tells other emigre physicists like Wigner, Albert Einstein, John Wheeler, who's an American physicist, but had done his own postdoc with Bohr some years earlier. They knew each other very well. Within days, several laboratories up and down the East Coast had actually verified this reaction. And for them, it was easy because they knew what to look for. The, the hard part was having these chemists like Hahn and Strassmann really do the kind of chemical assays to find barium. Once you know to look for barium, then even physicists <laughs> with some chemists help could verify that the, some of the fission products were in fact barium way down the periodic table, not things near uranium. So during that sabbatical, Bohr then kept working with, uh, with Wheeler and they worked out a more detailed quantitative analysis building very directly on Meitner's and Frisch's work. By this point, Meitner and Frisch had, had published a few very short letters about their work that are duly cited by, by Wheeler and Bohr. Uh, and they work out a kind of lengthy, detailed quantitative theory of this nuclear fission. In fact, building again much on Meitner's work, it's Bohr and Wheeler who finally uh, conclude that the fissionable, the most unstable isotope of uranium is not the most common kind you find in the ground. That's U-238. The fissionable one, the one that's most easy to undergo this kind of splitting reaction, has a couple fewer neutrons than the common one, U-235. What's kind of chilling or stunning to me their article was published in the Physical Review literally on the same day that the Nazis invaded Poland, which was the final kind of trigger for the, for the start of the overt fighting of the Second World War. Again, we see this collision of these, of these time scales. So everyone in physics, everyone in physics knew immediately that nuclear fission would, could lead to bombs. This is an enormous release of energy each time a single nucleus split. The energy scales were nothing like typical chemical scales, chemical reaction scales. So everyone knows that. And then their second thought was, oh, the Germans must know this too. After all, fission had been identified in the Berlin laboratory. And as we were just saying a few minutes ago, although many researchers uh, fled Nazi Germany, it still retained some of the world's leading experts in nuclear physics or nuclear science more broadly. Heisenberg, as we said, had stayed behind. Otto Hahn, Hans Geiger, who invented the Geiger counter, Walter Bote, Max Planck, Max von Laue. I mean, a long list of these folks had, and were still in Germany let alone uh, at the forefront of laboratory tests of these things. So again, just to give a sense of how, how rapidly these things were all kind of colliding, uh, the, the conceptual work, the laboratory work around these new kinds of nuclear transformations and uh, the headlong rush into an, a, a world-spanning war. So uh, I mentioned the Anschluss where the Nazis basically absorb um, uh, Austria. That was uh, in March of 38. By December 38, we have these developments of Hahn and Strassmann identifying barium, Meitner and Frisch working out the first real physical explanation, who arrives in New York City. That spring, the Nazis then occupy Czechoslovakia, then Poland is what finally triggers the uh, announcements, the de declarations of war by many other countries. So within days of the invasion of Poland, Britain, France, Australia, New Zealand, and Canada, notably not the United States, but many of these other countries, explicitly declare war against Germany. The Soviet Union invades Poland soon after that. This is all happening at essentially the same time. What's also happening is that in many, many of these countries on multiple sides, multiple fronts of what would become the actual warring parties, physicists are consulting with government officials to say there could be an, a vastly new type of weapon based on these nuclear transformations. So this is just a, a, a handful of these, again, happening in, with kind of lightning speed. As we now know, as early as April 1939, barely four months after the very first indication from Hahn and Strassmann that nuclear fission could happen, uh, the German uh, Reich Ministry of Education starts holding secret meetings on military applications of nuclear fission, meaning weapons. They, could make, they were beginning, beginning to be briefed about the possibility of nuclear bombs, and they, and they began banning the export of uranium. They figured they need a lot of this fissionable material. That same month, it was much less well known. Other historians have now, I know, documented it quite clearly. The Japanese government began its own secret nuclear weapons project, it was codenamed NI. I'm not sure what that stands for. This, unlike the German one, was, was really underfunded. It was not seen as a high priority for the current war. In fact, what it turned out to be mostly was a kind of way to, uh, for senior physicists to keep younger physicists out of direct fighting. It was kind of like a, you could, instead of being drafted, you could do some research is, is more or less how it functioned. But there was a formal Japanese nuclear weapons project uh, founded as early as April, 1939. Very soon after that, Britain starts considering uh, nuclear weapons. 
and they began ramping up, especially after um, Robert Frisch, who then had moved uh, once the, once the Nazis took over Denmark, he was no longer safe there. So he resettled in uh, in Britain, as did Rudolf Pyrrhus, who had to leave Germany. They compiled a, a top secret memo to the British government, again, saying not only are nuclear weapons possible, but you only need a little bit, comparative little bit of this fissionable, this rare isotope of uranium. They actually, as we now know, underestimated how little um, uh, uranium, fissionable uranium you'd need. So it looked even closer to being feasible and, and convinced the British government to start uh, real efforts. And at that same time in the Soviet Union, another physicist, Igor Krachatov, starts informing the Soviet government, Soviet government about uh, nuclear weapons and so on. Much like in Japan, in the Soviet Union, we now know this was a low priority at first, but nonetheless was a formal project. And then again, perhaps most famously in the United States, Einstein himself, uh, really signed a letter. He, he didn't compose this letter. Some of his emigre friends and colleagues in physics wrote the letter in hopes that Einstein would sign it, and he did. They convinced him to. He wrote a letter directly to, to President Franklin Roosevelt. By this point, Einstein was such a worldwide celebrity, they, they had channels to get this literally into the hands of the President of the United States. And you can see the, the letter here. You can Google it, find the text. Um, where Einstein basically says, I've recently come to learn this nuclear fission thing is possible. I've also learned that Germany is now uh, kind of hoarding uranium. This could be a very serious development. All these folks recognized very quickly that nuclear fission could have very immediate worldly effects. Uh, so I see Obi asked, did they, um, how do they contain the heat of a reaction? Obi asked about the nuclear fission. Good. What's important to recognize is that these very earliest um, experiments were never leading to anything like what we would now call a chain reaction. We'll talk more about this action in the next class. So they were never getting unlimited numbers of nuclei to undergo fission. Thank goodness, uh, they would have blown up the laboratory. So the, the, the heat released when one or two or three, a small number of, of nuclei fission was um, not remarkable. If they, had if they had expected that, they could have maybe instrumented their laboratory to just barely maybe measure, but I bet it was not even measurable given the fission rates they were encountering. We'll see, of course, soon that that, that no longer becomes true when, when these uh, re reactions get, get scaled up. But that's more, we'll, we'll talk more about that um, in Wednesday's class. Yabo asks, why did Chadwick win the Nobel Prize for Physics as opposed to Chemistry? Ah, good. In the reading by Crawford Simon Walker, they identified one reason it might have denied the Nobel Prize was that radioactive was considered a chemistry project. Yabo, yeah, thanks, it's a great point. So I think the reason that, um, that uh, Chadwick won the Nobel Prize in physics was because he, he was identifying a new physical particle. I mean, what he was credited with, the reason they thought this work was so important was not that he, not only that he was dealing with radioactivity, which was actually winning prizes both in physics and in chemistry. Marie Curie's first prize was actually in physics and then in chemistry or vice versa. She wound up winning in both. But for Chadwick, it was actually identifying a new physical particle um, which I think was then kind of seen as, as a kind of physics domain, more or less, as opposed to the kind of chemical transmutations um, or the transitions in the identities of chemical elements, like what the Joliot and Curies were doing, and, and they indeed won the prize in chemistry here. But I mean, you're, 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 the question points to, is a good one, it points to a larger theme. There was an awfully fuzzy line then as now, but especially then, what would count as chemistry versus physics often could become kind of political. I mean, the, in the sense that the, the very small circle of uh, members of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences that decided these things, they could frankly push one way or the other based on other motives. Did they not want to give a prize to one person or often a representative of some country? We get very nationalistic. They don't honor this country, do honor that. They could frankly kind of bend the rules or move that, move that uh, boundary to suit many kinds of purposes. So it was not, there were clear criteria separating say what would count as a physics prize versus chemistry. And, and there's a, a lot of evidence, including from the first author of that uh, article, Elizabeth Crawford was really immersed in the Nobel prize archives for, for much of her career. So much of this we learned from, from Crawford's work. So it's a good point. But I, th I think for Chadwick, the argument would have been, he found a new kind of piece of matter, a new piece of nature. And that I think struck them as, as being more like the other physics prizes. Very good. Other, other questions about that? any of the, of, the, of the nuclear physics concepts, or, or again, this kind of amazing, we might call it a tight coupling between events in various laboratories and kind of physicist networks, who's writing to whom, who's taking a steamer ship to where. 
uh, with these kind of worldly geopolitical shifts. It's an amazing uh, conjunction. Do we know if Einstein ever spoke with FDR? He, he did not. Thank you, Gary. So in fact, there was a bit of a delay. FDR didn't actually receive the letter for a couple of weeks. He did read it. We know it was handed to him literally in the Oval Office and he read it. Uh, what's important though, it, is that the, the myth that Einstein sort of invented the Manhattan Project with this letter, that is just crazy, crazy dramatically um, overblown. Einstein signed the letter, he read it, he signed it. He thought it was important and he was glad to have some intermediary get it to FDR where it was delayed and had almost no impact. Uh, and so we'll talk more about this actually in Wednesday's class. Uh, there was a, a little kind of study group that was put together a few months after Einstein's letter was received, not, or certainly not only because of Einstein's letter, by that point, other science advisors had the ear of, of um, Roosevelt and said, this really does look like it's worth paying attention to. The British were already now much more engaged as well after the Frisch Pyros memo. So there were many reasons for the US federal government to begin paying a little attention. You'll see they paid actually a little attention to questions about uranium and uh, fission and weapons uh, around the time of Einstein's letter, but not only because of Einstein's letter. And then we'll see in some more detail on Wednesday that the real kind of ramp up came uh, only uh, quite a bit with, with quite a bit more of a delay. So Einstein uh, never spoke directly with FDR about this and he never followed up. He wrote it, he signed the letter and then, you know, and that was that. So the, 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 the notion that Einstein kind of jumpstarted the Manhattan Project, which one can still find with, uh, with what I'll call lazy Googling, uh, that's really kind of totally out of proportion. Good, any other questions on that? Now there's one last part I wanna talk about today, which I think is very juicy. Uh, let's let's la launch into that and then uh, some more time for discussion as well. Okay, <clears throat> so let's talk about uh, Werner Heisenberg and what was going on within, for those who stayed within Germany uh, with this constellation of events. So by September of 1939, right around the, the start of the, ov the overt start of the Second World War, the German Art, uh, Army Ordnance Office took over the uh, Kaiser Wilhelm Institute for Physique, this really quite beautiful, funky building uh, in Berlin or just in the outskirts of Berlin, Berlin Dahlem, uh, exactly to coordinate research on nuclear fission. They'd been briefed, they'd had these secret briefings since that spring, fission's a thing, it could lead to weapons. So the army took over the Physics Institute, took over control of it. A little while later, Heisenberg was actually placed uh, in charge of it. So Heisenberg from the very early uh, days became a member of what was called the uh, Uran, Uran Verein, which is a, the Uranium Club, the little informal group of nuclear um, physicists and chemists who were, who were working on fission, trying to learn more. Uh, Heisenberg personally advised the military multiple times about possibilities of nuclear fission, both for weapons, this could lead to explosive release of, uh, of, of explosive power in a bomb, but also for civilian power generation, what we now call reactors. And again, this has been shown now in, in a lot of detail that Heisenberg and other uh, from the small circle of uh, colleagues were, were actively advising the army ordinance uh, from as early as 39, 40. And as I say, within a few years then Heisenberg himself was put in charge of the entire uh, nuclear effort. At the same time, Heisenberg was sent on these diplomatic missions throughout neutral countries or especially occupied countries, including for example, Denmark. Uh, and now this is right on the heels, it's only two years or three years after he had been, uh, you know, denied this promotion by the Deutsche Physik movement. So you can see how rapidly Heisenberg's star had risen yet again uh, among uh, leading German government officials. By 1939-40, he was seen as actually quite useful in the context of nuclear fission. So what he would do is go basically go on, on diplomatic missions to basically be the, the, one of the public faces of the German government not to proclaim pro-Nazi slogans, but rather to show off the kind of grandness of, of German accomplishments in higher learning. Here's this very young uh, Nobel laureate who knows about you know, the atom and these mysterious things. So he'd give these very well attended public lectures, uh, usually in places that the Nazis had just taken over and occupied and sometimes in neutral countries. Uh, he, as I say, to many colleagues who heard him, colleagues who'd known him for, for years, he sounded, he often sounded explicitly nationalistic. He, he was never spouting the kind of most, most what I would consider grotesque or most obvious Nazi kind of speaking points, but he was certainly proudly German. And at some points even seemed to suggest, at least as some of these colleagues heard him, that maybe it would be a good thing if Germany ruled all of Europe, not the Nazis, 
But if Germany really extended its rule, because after all, this was the high point of European culture and learning. This is what inspires this play, this amazing play, Copenhagen, uh, which uh, hopefully some of you um, are familiar with. But there's a link uh, on the Canvas site you can actually watch for free through the MIT Library site, a really quite beautiful BBC production, a filmed production of this uh, play, Copenhagen, by Michael Frayn. Uh, it stars Daniel Craig, who plays Jan Heisenberg, uh, the same actor who would go on to play James Bond. It's really high-end production. So this play is really fascinating. I encourage you to watch the film or, or read the play. And it swirls around one of these real life visits where Heisenberg was sent on one of these diplomatic missions, in this case, to Copenhagen very soon after the Nazis had occupied uh, Denmark. So while he's in Copenhagen giving his fancy lectures, he visits with his own uh, you know, mentor, almost kind of father figure, Niels Bohr. Now they were afraid that by this point, Bohr's house might have been bugged, might have recording devices placed in it by the Nazis. Bohr was well known to be uh, not at all sympathetic to the Nazis. And so Bohr and Heisenberg take these long strolls as they always used to do in the gardens near Bohr's house, away from any sort of inside microphones. And, and what the play does, I think just beautifully, very evocatively, is try to reimagine scenarios of what they possibly could have talked about away from the microphones sometimes with Marguerite de Boer, who we know was almost always part of Boer's kind of conversation, scientific, political, and otherwise. So the play has these three characters, uh, Marguerite de Boer, Niels Bohr, and Werner Heisenberg. What do, what do they think is going on with the world? What do they think the scientist's responsibility is? And so on, it's a marvelous play. Okay, so we know that Heisenberg advised the German military authorities and multiple times actually, that nuclear bombs were possible, but probably not during the present war. And that was uh, as much because it looked like the Germans would just win very quickly. This was the period of what was called the Blitzkrieg, that sort of lightning war, where everyone expected Germany would win right away. They invaded Poland on September 1st, 1939. Everyone figured the war would be over within a year or two because it was started going so well. Very few, uh, the Nazis suffered very few setbacks militarily uh, once over, open uh, warfare had started. Uh, but the authorities nonetheless saw a future promise for this kind of weapon. They were imagining, remember, a thousand year Reich. They were, had a long view. And so they continued to fund Heisenberg's effort and also to things like seize the, uh, the Belgian Congo, the so-called Belgian Congo, the territory within Central Africa that was known to be very rich in uranium ore. Uh, and so they wanted to get more raw uranium and fund Heisenberg's efforts and eventually install him to be head of, of uh, the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute. Members of Heisenberg's team then of this group began working on what would it take to, to scale up these nuclear fission reactions. One member of Walter Bota estimated that the moderator, the, the material to slow down the neutrons like the paraffin wax in the early experiments, that to do that with carbon or graphite, you'd need kind of ultra pure carbon. Any, any impurities would absorb neutrons and not slow them down. If you absorb the neutrons, you stop the fission reactions, you stop a chain reaction. So Bolta, as, as we now know, overestimated how hard it would be to do this with carbon. So he advised instead that they turn to heavy water, water that's made not with ordinary hydrogen, but with um, deuterium, with, with um, uh, hydrogen atoms that have extra neutrons in the nuclei. So you have he what's called heavy water. There's this kind of amazing commando raid to blow up a heavy water plant in Norway that the Nazis wanted to, because they wanted to steal large amounts of heavy water, literally like parachuting in and cover of night, crazy, crazy stuff. Meanwhile, Heisenberg began on the theoretical side to estimate how much of this fissionable isotope U-235 would they need to have a runaway explosion, the so-called critical mass, and he actually overestimated by a factor of about 10 how much you'd need, uh, at the same time, though in, in ignorance of the underestimate uh, by this Frisch Pyrrhals uh, calculation. So as the war dragged on, the bomb project gets lower and lower priority within Germany, at first because they figured they'll just win by conventional means, and, uh, and later as the war begins to really bog down and the Nazis do get turned back uh, militarily at various points, then the Reich needs to actually uh, direct resources to these sort of short-term immediate military priority. So it's a low priority at first because it looks like they'll win. It remains a low priority later because they have other short-term priorities. So <clears throat> the physicist Sam Gouchman, who helped introduce the notion of quantum spin, he had emigrated uh, from the Netherlands actually in the late 20s, well before the rise of Nazism. His family stayed behind and in fact they later perished in Auschwitz in Jewish background. Uh, he led the Allied reconnaissance missions inside Germany 
to learn about this German, uh, the Nazi nuclear effort and to literally kidnap German nuclear scientists before they could um, flee to either the Soviets or anywhere else. This is happening before the end of the Second World War. There's other crazy stories that a pro baseball player named Mo Berg, this really happened, was, uh, was basically drafted into what would become the CIA. It was uh, the Office of Strategic Services at the time in the United States. He, uh, he spoke German. He was sent to um, neutral countries near Germany, like Switzerland, to listen to these public lectures by Heisenberg. With, uh, the baseball player was armed with a pistol. He was basically an uh, uh, amateur spy. And if it sounded like the Nazi bomb project was getting too advanced, Berg was ordered to assassinate Heisenberg. He, he didn't, because it didn't sound like they were that close. I mean, these amazing, pretty ridiculous or crazy stories. Meanwhile, the Alzos mission uh, is successful. They gather enormous documentation from the German efforts, and they also capture 10 German nuclear scientists in the spring, even before Germany formally surrenders. They ca capture them as basically prisoners of war, and they ferret them out of the country to Farm Hall, this quite lovely country home, country house uh, in rural England, not too far from Cambridge University. This was called Operation Epsilon. Once again, the house was bugged, the conversations were constantly audio taped, uh, transcribed and translated. Uh, and you have an excerpt in the reader. I'll let you read through here. Let me just say very quickly, and then I'm running late on time. Uh, the first reaction upon hearing that uh, nuclear weapons had been made and had actually been used, in this case against the city of Hiroshima by uh, the uh, American forces, the first reaction is utter disbelief. Heisenberg couldn't believe that anyone, let alone the sort of bumbling Americans, could possibly have gotten so far along in this project, which his own group had made only halting progress on. A little while later, as the transcript reveals, it's a different physicist, Carl Friedrich von Weizsäcker, who says, well, we didn't make a bomb because we didn't want to. We didn't do it, as he says, on principle. If we'd wanted Germany to win the war, we would have succeeded. And Heisberg then says, ah, I was convinced uh, of the possibility of making a reactor, not, uh, not for power, not for, as a weapon, but I never thought we'd make a bomb. And at the bottom of my heart, I was really glad it would be a reactor and not a bomb. They begin making, trying to make sense of what's happening so quickly around them. Again, just to go quickly here, sorry for the, I'll, I'll post the slides because you can see them. The idea that Heisenberg had actually purposefully resisted Hitler by dragging his feet, by slowing the project was not a, a position that Heisenberg himself ever articulated, but other people began saying it on his behalf. Heisenberg said we'd worked hard on reactors, which was true. He just chose not to emphasize they'd also had ideas about weapons. But other people speaking in some sense on behalf of Heisenberg uh, put together a story that Heisenberg had purposely dragged his feet so as to uh, deny Hitler a nuclear weapon. And we have this amazing correspondence of Heisenberg writing privately to these journalists saying you got it all wrong. And here's an example. I would not want this remark to be misunderstood as saying that I myself engaged in resistance to Hitler. And so I'll stop there. I apologize for running a bit long. I have time for a few questions. I'd be glad to stay on uh, longer if people would like. If, of course, feel, feel free to head off your other classes. Um, and again, the slides are on, are on the, uh, the Canvas site. So anyway, here's, here's part of, again, this kind of unsteady mixture of really cutting edge nuclear physics unfolding in real time uh, with this kind of really fast changing series of, uh, of political um, and kind of military and bureaucratic maneuvers all getting wrapped up together. Any questions on that? So I encourage you to go back to the Operation Epsilon uh, excerpts. We do have the excerpt of the actual farm hall transcripts, which I put on the Canvas site, including that the, the fateful day of August 6th, the reactions to the BBC reports of the bombing of Hiroshima. And lots, lots more to talk about that as well. We'll see some hints of this in the documentary film. We can talk more in our informal discussion uh, next week. And in the meantime, we'll pick up this story then on Wednesday with what does some of the physicists outside of Germany do with these same set of ideas about nuclear fission and weapons prospects. So we'll talk more about uh, allied uh, efforts during the Second World War uh, on Wednesday. So sorry for running long. Uh, stay well. Good luck with paper two, and I'll see you soon. Bye, everyone.